In this video, I'm going to do two curve sketching questions with you. We're going to sketch the curve of a polynomial function, and another. the second example will be of a rational function. So make sure you understand how the first derivative tells you uh, whether the original function is increasing or decreasing, and its zeros are critical points that could be local max or min points. And also make sure you understand that the second derivative tells us the concavity of the original function, and its zeros tell us possible points of inflection. So if you don't know that terminology, make sure you go back and watch the previous videos in this unit. So let's get started. Uh, first example, here's our polynomial function, x cubed plus 6x squared plus 9x. So we're going to follow an algorithm that I've made up for curve sketching. Uh, it's going to take us through a bunch of steps for what we need to do if we want to draw a very accurate graph of this function. So we're always going to start by considering, does this function have any asymptotes or holes? So are there any, first of all, uh, are there any restrictions in the domain of this graph? Well, it's a polynomial function. Polynomial functions don't have any domain restrictions, and they don't have any asymptotes or holes in their graphs. So we don't have to worry about that. So for this example, none. For our next example with a rational function, we will have to consider this. The next step in our algorithm is going to be determining the x-intercept. Oh, we're not given the x-intercepts here. We're going to determine the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts of the graph. So the x-intercepts are when the original function has a y-value of 0. So we would have to set the original function equal to 0 and solve for x. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to start by common factoring out an x, right? If we want to solve for a 0 of a function, uh, we want to get it into factored form. So I common factored out an x. My second factor is a quadratic that we can sum in product factor, right? 3 and 3 are the numbers that multiply to 9 and add to 6. So that goes to x plus 3 times x plus 3 squared, right? It's a perfect square trinomial. And now that it's in factored form, if either of the factors were equal to 0, the whole function would be 0. So if x was 0, the product would be 0, or if x was negative 3, the product would be 0. So I have two x-intercepts. I've got an x-intercept at 0, 0, and one at negative 3, 0. So we have two x-intercepts for this function. So I'm going to plot those quickly. We've got an x-intercept here, and we have an x-intercept here. So we know two points on our function so far. Let's also find the y-intercept. Well, y-intercept, uh, when x is 0, uh, what's the value of y? We already have that right here, right? This is both an x and a y-intercept. But if we didn't, if it didn't share an x and y intercept, we would actually have to plug 0 in for x and calculate y. And in this case, we will get the point 0, 0. So we already have our y intercept plotted as well. The next thing we want to do is find the critical points. Remember, critical points are points where our first derivative is either 0 or undefined. Let's figure out what value of x would make our first derivative either 0 or undefined. Now, in this example, there aren't going to be any ways it could be undefined, so we'll just find the zeros of the first derivative. So our first, well, it's actually called g of x in this question, right? Uh, yes, so g prime of x. So I need g prime of x. So here is my function x cubed plus 6x squared plus 9x. I'm going to need g prime of x, so I'll differentiate it. So 3x squared plus 12x plus 9 plus 12x plus 9. So how could this be 0? So let's set it to 0 and solve. I'll common factor out a 3. Now my factor inside here is a quadratic. So what multiplies to 3 adds to 4 is 3 and 1. So I get actually two critical numbers here. I get negative 3 and negative 1. Those are the x values that tell me uh, the first derivative is 0 at those x values, which means on the original function, I would have a horizontal tangent at those x values, which means it's a possible max or min point, right? It could be a local max, right? Horizontal tangent there. It could be a local min, horizontal tangent there. Or maybe it's some weird shape like this, S shape where there's a horizontal tangent, but it's not a max or a min point. So we don't actually know if it's a local max or min, but we know at these x values, there's a potential for a local max or min. We'll test to see if it is later. And notice it says critical points, right? We're going to want the y values. When we're graphing, we're always going to want the y values so we can actually plot the points. So when x is negative 3, it makes the derivative 0, right? That tells me there's a horizontal tangent there. But where is the original function? What is g at negative 3? I think it just so happens negative 3 is an x-intercept, right? So we've already calculated the y value is 0. So I'm just going to make a list here. Critical points. 
So negative 3, 0. And how about when x is negative 1? If I plug negative 1 into the original function, what would I get? If I plug negative 1 into the original function, uh, I would get negative 4. Oh, I should write it. I should keep the same notation I wrote here. So g at negative 1 is negative 4, which means my critical point is negative 1, negative 4. So let's plot those two critical points. So it was at negative 3, 0. We already have that. And negative 1, negative 4. Negative 1, negative 4. So right here, uh, it may be a local max. It may be a local min. It may do something else like this, but I know for sure at this point and this point, there would be a horizontal tangent because the first derivative is zero at those points. And the first derivative tells us the slope of the tangent. So we know critical points now. So potential local maximum endpoints. What we also want to figure out before we actually do our final graph are where are some possible changes in concavity for our function? So where are possible points of inflection? And we could find those by figuring out what makes the second derivative either zero or undefined. So my first derivative is here, 3x squared plus 12x plus 9. So let's find our second derivative by differentiating the first derivative, and I get 6x plus 12. Now let's find, well there's no way that could be undefined, so our only possible points of inflection would be whatever makes that be zero, and that would be an x value of negative 2. So at an x value of negative 2, there's a possible change in concavity, right? There's a possible point of inflection. Where is the original function when x is negative 2? So if we plug negative 2 back into the original equation, let's go ahead and do that. If I plug negative 2 back into the original equation, so if I plug negative 2 into here, I'd get negative 8 plus 24 minus 18. So that would be negative 2. So g at negative 2 is negative 2. So possible POI is at negative 2, negative 2. So let's plot that point on our function, negative 2, negative 2. At this point right here, there's a possible change in concavity. So the function might go from concave up to concave down or vice versa. The next thing we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to make a sign chart and test to see the intervals of concavity and the intervals of increasing and decreasing for our original function so that we can actually tell if these points are in fact local min or max points and if this point is in fact a point of inflection. So this is how we set up our sign chart. So you're always going to use all of your critical numbers, possible points of inflection, and vertical asymptotes if you had any as your dividing points. So here are my dividing points, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. Remember these, this was a critical number, this was a critical number, this was a possible point of inflection. So those are your dividing points. Make sure they go in ascending order. And then we're going to want to pick a point within each interval that surrounds that. So always put negative infinity and infinity at the beginning and end of your chart. And then we're going to pick a test value in each of the intervals. So I could pick like negative 4, negative two and a half, negative one and a half, and zero as my test values. And then what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're actually going to want to test and see what's the value of the first derivative in each interval, what's the value of the second derivative in each interval, and then conclude what does that tell us about the original function? Because keep in mind, our end goal is to graph the original function. So let's go ahead and test these numbers. So we'll test negative four in the first derivative. And I've written the equation here for us. So we plug negative four into the first derivative. All we care about, not necessarily what the actual numerical value is, but is that numerical value positive or negative? If I plug negative four in for x into this equation, I get a positive value. If I plug negative four in for x into this equation, the second derivative, I get a negative value. So what does that tell us about the original function? So keep in mind, the sign of the first derivative tells us if the original function is increasing or decreasing, right? Because it tells us the slope of the tangent. So I know we have an increasing function. So g at x, I know in this interval from negative infinity to negative 3 is increasing. So the function is increasing. What does this value tell me? The negative. So the negative tells me whether the, fun the original function is concave up or concave down. Since it's negative in this interval, I know my function is concave down. I know it's concave down because second derivative is negative, right? Second derivative tells you what's happening to the tangent slopes. So we know the tangent slopes are decreasing, which means the original function must be concave down. 
So I have a function that it's increasing but concave down. So it's going to look like this, increasing but concave down. So that's what the function is going to look like in that interval. How about the next interval? If I test negative 2.5 into my first derivative, I would get a negative value. If I plug it into my second derivative, I will once again get a negative value. So since the first derivative is negative, I know the original function is decreasing, right? Tangent slopes in that interval are all negative. What's happening to those tangent slopes? They're decreasing. So that tells me the function is concave down, right? Second derivative being negative tells us the original function is concave down. So I need to draw a function that is decreasing and concave down. So that would look like this. The next interval, negative 1.5. If I plug that into the first derivative, I get negative. If I plug it into the second derivative, I get positive. So first derivative being negative tells me our function is decreasing. Second derivative being positive tells me that it is concave up, right? Meaning second derivative being positive, concave up, that means that the tangent slopes, so although the function is decreasing, the tangent slopes are increasing, which makes it concave up. So it would look like this. So I need to make sure it's decreasing the whole time, but concave up. So it looks like this. And our last interval, when x is 0, I plug 0 in, I get positive, positive. So I have an increasing function that is concave up. So I need to draw a function that's increasing and concave up. So that's just the general shapes of my function. So what we have figured out, since the function was increasing before the x value of negative 3 and then decreasing after negative 3, notice that that tells me there is a local max point. So local max at, what was it, negative 3, 0. And then at the x value of negative 2, I mean the function is decreasing on either side, so there's no max or min, but it has a change in concavity. It changes from concave down to concave up. So there's a point of inflection, point of inflection at negative 2, negative 2. And then the function went from decreasing before negative 1 to increasing after negative 1, so there's a local min there. So we have a local min, local min at negative 1, and I believe the y value is negative 4. So let's sketch this function out. So we know before the x value of negative 3, it was increasing and concave down. So it looks like this. After it was decreasing and concave down, at this point here, it switched to decreasing and concave up and then it was increasing and concave up for the remainder of its domain. So it looks like this. That's what our function looks like. Let's go over to Desmos and just kind of verify what we figured out here. So in Desmos, here's that same function. right? So we figured out that before negative 3, the first derivative was always positive. And if you look at all the tangent slopes I have plotted here, the tangent slopes are all positive before an x value of negative 3. At negative 3, the tangent slope is 0. That's why it was a critical number. Between negative 3 and negative 1, the tangent slopes were all negative. And then at negative 1, it had a tangent slope of 0. And then after negative 1, the tangent slopes were all positive. So if we look back at our chart, so I was talking about tangent slopes there, so I was talking about the first derivative. They were positive, then they were negative between negative 3 and negative 1, and then after negative 1, they were positive. Let me show that one more time. So before negative 3, the tangent slopes were all positive. Between negative 3 and negative 1, they were all negative. And then after negative 1, all the tangent slopes were positive. Okay, a little more complicated to understand is if we look at the second derivative. The second derivative was negative for everything before an x value of negative 2. So if we look at what's happening before I get to this point right here, before I get to that point right there, what's happening to the tangent slopes. The tangent slopes start off at a very high positive number, and those tangent slopes start decreasing. Right? The tangent slope values get smaller, 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 they go to zero, and then they're now they're becoming negative, so it's getting even smaller, 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 smaller. So the tangent slopes themselves, their values are decreasing over that interval. Right? The second derivative tells us the rate of change of the tangent slope. So the tangent slopes are decreasing, therefore the second derivative is negative 
over those two intervals, right? And the function is concave down. And then the function switches to concave up when the tangent slopes start increasing. The tangent slopes start increasing after an x5, negative 2, right? The tangent slopes start going up. The tangent slopes are increasing from an x value of negative 2 to infinity. That's why the second derivative is positive there. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video there, and I'm going to post a second example of the rational function. So if you want to see a video going over how we would do a curve sketching question for this function, right, a rational function where our variable is in the denominator, uh, stay tuned and watch the next video that I'll post. All right, hope that helped.